All right, welcome everybody. It is September 14th and you are at the Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Um, there are a few people on the call that I haven't seen before. So just uh, a reminder, we do have the antitrust policy notice that is being displayed on the screen. Um, there are a number of people here from different organizations. And so we need to make sure that we're adhering to um, the different uh, antitrust and competition laws across the world. And then uh, the second thing that we have to remember about the meeting is that we do have a code of conduct. So be respectful of other people on the call and their opinions and ideas. And then for our announcements today, we have the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter. It goes out each Friday. If you do have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, please do leave a comment. Uh, for consideration um, on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Any other announcements that anybody has for today? Okay, no. All right, so we do have two quarterly reports. We have the Cello report. It's been out there about a week or so. Um, I think we're um, mostly approving that. I haven't seen any comments come through. Uh, I think we do still have a few more people who need to review before we can um, push that or until the, the two weeks is up. So we'll give that a, a bit more time. And then the second report came in yesterday. Uh, the Firefly report came in. I did uh, have a number of questions on it. I think mostly driven by the first comment about wanting to move to graduated project status. I don't know that I would typically ask these questions in a project report, but I did think it was important um, for us to be aware and as we prepare for that request um, to, to ensure that we know exactly what's happening with that particular project. Um, nothing, nothing on the, um, necessarily the report itself, I don't think, just uh, some clarifications and questions that will help us as we um, start to have that discussion. Any questions on the Firefly report? Um, I know not, not a lot of people have had a chance to look at it yet, but um, any other co comments or questions on the Firefly report? Okay, if there's not, then we will move on. Uh, so we do have two reports that are due next week, Thursday, the BASU and the Caliper report. Uh, so we'll look to see those coming in um, probably after our next call next week, but um, do keep an eye out as those uh, might appear in the uh, review. So uh, for discussion items today, we do have, um, yeah, hey Jim. Hey, sorry, Tracy. Uh, just very quickly, uh, since we're still on the reports, um, mm -hmm. people who have seen the Firefly reports may have seen uh, our intention to apply for graduation. So just want to mention that to give folks um, a heads up. Um, the report is being, uh, the proposal is being written and should be circulating very soon. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I did mention that um, because I think most of my comments are driven by that. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, appreciate right as we were review. finishing that. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks, Tracy. But yeah, no, I, I think that's great, Jim. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing that. Um, and then as we're speaking about, I guess, graduated projects and requests, I did see Cacti also um, created an issue yesterday um, on, the, um, on the TOC repo to talk about um, their desire to also graduate. So Rama, I see your hand is up. Yeah, uh, I think Peter's not on the call, but uh, yeah, Peter, uh, we had a CACTA meeting, meeting yesterday and uh, Peter said he was going to ask for uh, uh, a consideration of uh, CACTA status in the next UC meeting. But I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you need uh, uh, anything? Should I send something to the TOC members before that meeting or can we just do a quick presentation during the call? Uh, we could do both. I mean, uh, obviously, if people have time to review your material before the call and provide any thoughts or feedback, that's great. Um, but we could also do the presentation directly in the call and uh, let people ask questions and, and comment on that there. Okay, 
So sending the slides is okay, or do you need a, a dog for a wiki? Uh, so I don't think we've actually, I, I actually looked at the project life cycle yesterday. Um, it typically hasn't been any sort of wiki page or anything like that, that people have used in the past for that. I think it's just been the kind of the request and then a conversation during the TOC meeting. So I think slides are fine to present and, and kind of answer those questions about why you think you meet the incubation exit criteria. Um, I think that that will work out fine. Cool. Uh, I'll share the slide before the meeting. Thanks. Okay. And Jim, what, what were you guys doing? Were you putting together a wiki page or how are you going to uh, do that? Because I don't know that we actually have a process around this. Yeah. Um, at the moment, it's just in uh, a drafting gist. Uh, I think we were planning okay. to create a, create a, a, a PR. So okay. I think uh, probably creating an issue uh, which would add it to the decision log. Would be yeah, that makes sense, right? Um, yeah. I think the decision log is, is a good place to capture these things. And then okay, so issue instead of PRs. Yeah, there, there might be. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah, I just realized probably. we don't have a place to capture that. So, OK, we'll create an issue. Sounds great. All right, any other questions, comments on, on this portion of the agenda, the, the project reports and kind of this graduation aspect? Yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's good to see uh, these two projects looking to, to move to graduate it. And so it'll be uh, great to have these discussions coming up in the upcoming TOC meeting. All right, uh, so for discussion today, uh, we have uh, the first item is an update on the security policy PR. So um, as far as I know, there was some conversation about this last week. And if I recall correctly from listening to the recording, it was um, that people would like to have the policy updated before we actually vote on it. Have we made any progress on that? So I, I did work on it this morning. Um, I'm partway through completing it and should be able to complete it um, certainly by next week. My apologies for taking so long on this. Um, I, I, it's not a big deal. I just just haven't had a, a chance to spend a couple of hours or on it. But um, I, I don't think it'll be very difficult and I will have it um, prepared for next week. Okay, no worries, Stephen. I, I mean, obviously things are busy and uh, we yeah, I feel bad. So. I should I should have had uh, I volunteered to do it. It's it's really not very hard, so I should get it done. All the hard work was done by the people that put together the document. I'm just really doing some mechanical updates to it, so I feel bad about not getting it. But anyway, next week. All right, sounds great. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, any other questions or comments on the security policy? Okay. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is a question for the TOC. Um, so as uh, Rai has reminded me, election season is coming up soon. And as we were, or as Rai was going through the process of trying to you know, put together the scripts and gather the right people, uh, we had a question about this particular statement that is in the charter, which says all maintainers or similar technical role in the case of supported projects that have different technical roles than TLC projects of any technical project who have been active in the past year. Um, so this is related to who gets to vote is basically this statement. Um, and so there's two ways that we could read this statement. Uh, one is that it would refer only to current maintainers who have been active in the past year. Uh, the second way is it would refer to maintainers regardless of the current status who have been active in the past year, meaning that if a maintainer has retired sometime in the past year, but was active at some point during the year um, versus just people who are currently maintainers and not retired maintainers. Um, so I, I guess the question to the TOC is, when we read this statement, do we read it as one or do we read it as two?
favorite? I read it as one. Okay. Peter? Same for me. All right. Jim? Uh, it feels like two for me because what's important is uh, the people doing the vote, knowing what's going on. So regardless of their status, if they've been active in the past year, they should be able to vote. Okay, thanks Jim. Rama? It sounds more like one than two to me. Because I think if you're a kind of path maintainer, it would be very strange to have you uh, uh, I guess speak off in the DOC. But I guess maybe that's me. All right, thanks Rama. Bart? Hey, Tracy, I think you're either a maintainer or you're not a maintainer, right? If we wanted to include X maintainers, I think we would have included X maintainers, right? Okay. So you're one. I am. Okay. Marcus? Well, I also read it as two, but I also think that one is more desirable. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else? So far, we've got four and a half, maybe for one, and one and a half, maybe for two. Um, <laughs> anybody strongly, strongly feel that it should be number two? I don't feel strongly about number two. I think one is 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 very clear. It's easy to enforce. Okay, thanks, Jim. Any other thoughts on this, Marcus? Yeah, one question. I mean, in, in the past, we we we're not restricted to to maintainers right so every contributor was able to vote and then i think with last year that, that has changed that only maintainers that's can vote that's correct okay. well i think i mean there we're losing maybe some people i mean that's just my personal uh, observation um i don't know what what was the the, the idea behind changing this to maintainers only do you, do you still remember? Uh, I'm thinking Hart might because he raised his hand fairly quickly. Yeah, I can answer that, Marcus, <laughs> at least. Um, so the idea was that, well, there were really a couple of things. Um, one was we had a lot of discussion over what defined a contributor and how to define a contributor. Uh, and it turned out that the definition turned out to be very broad. And people thought that, you know, if you like sent an email or uh, or edited a wiki, um, you know, maybe that it wasn't as important if you voted as, as someone who was an actual maintainer. Um, the other reason was that the election is just much, much, much easier to run um, if it's maintainers because we have you know, maintainer lists for all the projects. So we can just pull down the maintainer lists and get the eligibility from there. Uh, whereas in the past, it was a uh, massive effort and pain to track down everyone who contributed. Um, so I guess that's the short answer. Um, did that sort of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I... Yeah, I mean, for simplicity, this totally makes sense. Um, I'm just, I mean, I, I mean, I, I just know one uh, person who was very active as a contributing code, but then was not able to, uh, to vote last year because she was not a maintainer, uh, for any of the projects. But I mean, was still very active. I'm just having this particular instance in my mind. Uh, but I also do not intend to. I mean change this rule again because i mean what you said absolutely makes sense for me as well yeah i mean i guess my comment to that would be to encourage your friend to seek maintainer status absolutely <laughs>
Okay, thanks. So I just wanted to show this. This is the list that I maintain of all the maintainers and where they are active, what repos that they are maintainers for. This generates a CSV file, which has 245 people that are maintainers anywhere within Hyperledger or Hyperledger Labs, I think. I don't know that off the top of my head, I have to check. And then uh, once a day, we go through here. This shows the actions of anyone at all within Hyperledger. And then if we go here, this shows activity by maintainer per repo for the last uh, CY. So we can go in here and look at, you know, what has Telegram Sam done in the last calendar or the last year and see that what, what his activities were on that specific repo. So I, I have all this. And it makes it pretty easy to, uh, to generate this who has done what, where type activity. So. Right, I'm always impressed by your spy scripts. I wish there's a privacy preserving way to do that as well. <laughs> well, the so the thing is, uh, GHE runs off of the public um, GitHub event log. So I'm not using any, this data is on the public activity feed from GitHub. I'm not using any special sauce to get this data. Yeah, I, I understand. But I mean, if you have the superpowers to put something together like this, then this gives you uh, I mean, good, good insights. I mean, uh, which is good. All right, great. So I believe we have agreed to number one, um, Rai, just uh, so you were the one who brought it up. And so I'm pretty sure that's the, the expected um, or the hoped for um, result, if you will. Okay. Thank you for the guidance. All right. Thanks for bringing it up, Ryan. Thanks for thanks for keeping on top of the fact that we're supposed to do elections because like it would have completely slipped my mind if we would have got to December and I would have been like, oh, hey. Aren't we supposed to be electing people? <laughs> so um, I, I know Rai has been working on putting together the uh, schedule and whatnot, and I'm sure we'll be bringing that to a future TOC meeting so that everybody can review the schedule and um, approve that, because I believe we have to approve that before we can actually make it happen. Yeah, all, all credit for this uh, goes to Daniela for driving it. So this is something that I knew was going to happen this year, obviously, but Daniela has been... Uh, poking David and I in the back saying, get ready. So it happened earlier than I thought. Great. Well, I, I appreciate uh, what you, you folks do for us and keeping us on track and making sure that we're uh, paying attention to things that we should be paying attention to. So, all right. Uh, last item on the agenda then, uh, unless anybody else has anything they would like to discuss before we get to the task force. Uh, let me start with that. Is there anything else we should talk about before we get to the, the task force discussion? Nope. Okay. So I think the, the last thing then here is just the badging life cycle. Uh, I know uh, some folks have been meeting to talk about badging life cycle. I'm pretty sure we have a, another meeting tomorrow on this, but uh, it happened to come up on the agenda or the cycle for the different task force today. So we can uh, have a conversation about uh, where we're at and what's been going on. So Rama, um, maybe I'll hand it off to you at this point. Sure, thanks, Tracy. Can I take a question? Okay, so I'll just give an update on this. So this is still a task force who's, uh, uh, who's working through the process. Um, this is a uh, this is the initial set of notes that were drafted uh, that covered all of the history behind this task force, its objectives, uh, and uh, open questions. So we can still see that. I don't think it's changed anything here. Uh, 
uh, you just see a, refer- a couple of references uh, to YouTube videos. Uh, under this page, uh, you can also see uh, there have been three task force meetings so far. Actually, the first meeting was uh, sort of a group meeting. The TOC meeting on August 10th was converted into a task force meeting. Uh, so we had a full group discussion that day. And the subsequent two meetings uh, involved only uh, the members of the task force. Um, so uh, if you go to each of these pages, you'll find uh, uh, recording links. Uh, I have uh, notes. I just have to put them in. I just haven't done so yet, but I will very soon for, for all of these. But uh, for each of the meetings, you will find the full recordings if you go to the pages. Uh, so at a high level, uh, on the, the first meeting, uh, there was a discussion inspired by uh, Bobby around uh, uh, how to track uh, various criteria related to badging. And uh, Bobby's idea was that we uh, give, uh, uh, we have a token-based uh, criteria, so, or, or a credit-based criteria, uh, tokens and credits being equivalent, where a project accumulates a certain number of tokens or credits, and then it gets a particular badge based on uh, how many credits that uh, uh, particular badge requires, and uh, that way you can also uh, acquire, accumulate more badges, and uh, uh, depending on how many badges and what kind of badges you've accumulated, you can uh, move to a different stage in the project life cycle, as is shown here. So uh, that was one thing that uh, that is one major topic of the first uh, meeting. The also associated with that was how do we report uh, the, or how do we track these uh, tokens or these credits for each project. Uh, so there was some discussion around uh, uh, a dashboard, uh, probably one dashboard uh, for uh, uh, all the last projects, uh, maybe or, or maybe uh, one dashboard for each project, including each lab and each full project. I think uh, we sort of tentatively agreed that uh, each full project should have its own uh, health dashboard. Uh, wasn't exactly sh- we didn't exactly reach a conclusion on the on the lab projects, uh, but I'll, I'll come to this whole uh, discussion of tracking uh, in, in a second. Uh, the other thing we discussed uh, was uh, how, whether or not to incorporate the labs uh, within this life cycle as the uh, Linux Foundation Networking life cycle does. Uh, and there we sort of came to a conclusion that uh, based on feedback from uh, I think Tracy, Arun, Arno, that uh, it would be better to keep the labs uh, separate because uh, at least within Hyperledger, uh, the, uh, what we think of as a lab is substantially different from what we uh, think a, a project should be. So a lab can be uh, something very half-baked in terms of uh, its, uh, uh, its code, uh, but uh, as long as uh, it's proposing a good idea and it has potential, we allow it to be a, a lab. But a uh, project uh, requires a much uh, stronger set of uh, qualifications even to uh, get to the incubation stage. So I think that's something we're going to stick with unless anybody has any uh, objections to that. Um, uh, and of course, we, you, feel free to... Uh, uh, raise this question again uh, in later meetings or late task force meetings if uh, other thoughts occur to you. Um, on the question of, uh, going back to the question of uh, uh, tracking uh, uh, credits and uh, reporting them in dashboards, uh, periodically allowing uh, manual inspection as well as uh, some sort of automated uh, 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 filtering criteria that allows uh, a project to acquire a badge. Uh, I think Bobby's suggestion was that we use uh, blockchain or smart contract system to track this. And that seems to make sense from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, in the first, uh, in the subsequent task force meeting, what we then discussed was that uh, this is a great idea for a project, but uh, it is something we should probably uh, defer to a later stage because uh, the uh, building the entire infrastructure for this project requires a lot of thought and a lot of work. And uh, in the task force meeting, we, uh, we decided that uh, this would probably be best uh, left to uh, maybe next year. Maybe we propose this as a 
uh, uh, mentorship project next year. Uh, we, of course, before that, we uh, popularize the idea. We talk about what this actually involves, and uh, maybe we'll get some committed volunteers to to work on this uh, next year. Uh, our immediate uh, uh, goal is to uh, focus on uh, making the uh, uh, clearly outlining the criteria, outlining the uh, project life cycle transition criteria, state transition criteria. Uh, both going forward uh, in in life as well as uh, reversion if, if a particular project is not meeting its uh, uh, its duty. So uh, just want to pause there a bit and ask for uh, feedback or if anybody has any objections. So question is, uh, I mean, or rather, a trade decision is we move the infrastructure part of this, the whole uh, uh, the, the idea about uh, tracking credits to uh, a later date. Uh, right now, at least for this year, we just focus on uh, clearly drafting the set of badges and uh, 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 the uh, forward and reversal criteria for each stage in this diagram based on the badges that a project has accumulated. So that's going to be our uh, goal for the task force. Does that sound good to everybody? I don't see any hands, so I'm assuming that uh, everybody's happy with that. Uh, so, moving on to what we are doing right now. The past couple of weeks, we've been discussing uh, exactly, in, uh, actually, we went to this in the uh, most recent uh, uh, task force meeting. Uh, so, what we're trying to do right now is uh, draw up First thing we want to do is draw up a list of uh, uh, minimum list of badges, uh, or let, let's say a, a complete list of badges uh, that uh, any project should be aspiring for. Uh, later, we will, uh, there's a column here. Uh, so there are a bunch of things we want to list for these badges. The name, what, what are the criteria, how we're going to monitor uh, uh, a particular project to see whether or not it qualifies for a given badge, how frequently we do the monitoring, um, uh, and uh, uh, what, what is the uh, penalty for uh, non-compliance uh, with respect to that particular badge, and uh, most importantly, uh, how does a particular badge uh, factor into uh, a particular to any state transition criteria? So, like. It's, this is not complete yet. Uh, it's something we have to work on. So uh, in the last meeting, we went through maybe half of this table, as you can see, uh, and uh, we made some notes around uh, uh, what uh, uh, whether or not that particular badge is useful and uh, how we check for uh, check for the particular uh, uh, criteria that have been met by uh, the project maintainers and made some notes around that. Um, so thanks uh, to Tracy and Arun who've been uh, active in that uh, the uh, the task force meetings. Uh, thanks for all your uh, input, your suggestions, and feedback, which is all listed here. So if nobody has any, does anybody have anything to say right now, or I can just go over the list of uh, badges, uh, the criteria that we've already discussed so far, and uh, yeah, once. I run through the list. We will, of course, go back to the next task group meeting and continue the discussion. Any comments, questions at this point? I'm just trying to look at. Uh, yep, the, don't see any hands raised. Okay, so the list of badges here, if you look at column. One, they are drawn from. Let me just go back to the main page. Yeah, so there were a list of badges that were uh, described in an earlier, uh, that, that's the product of an earlier TSC meeting. I can see, as you can see, this was last updated in 2021. And uh, there's a list of badges here 
with uh, particular criteria that you listed. So, yeah, those are listed here. Uh, these go from legal up to the CII. Uh, have those there. And uh, in addition, uh, we've added a few extra uh, badges for consideration which seem to not necessarily be, uh, be covered by what's already, what is already in, this, uh, in the older list. So going over these badges, uh, so legal is uh, basically it refers to, if you go back to the criteria here, uh, the project being compliant with all uh, legal requirements, primarily it's uh, uh, that, uh, the, the code is covered under the Apache 2 license and uh, free of incompatible dependencies. Uh, the main thing we have to check here is whether, figure out is whether this can be tracked uh, in an automated way. So maybe uh, Rai has some opinions on this. Uh, do you know of any uh, actions that uh, scan an entire code base for uh, uh, licensing declaration? Um, I know it's easy to scan the repository for a license file, but uh, perhaps there's uh, some code that's not completely covered. So uh, maybe there's a, I mean, right now we check it manually, but other than that, uh, if, there, if there's a, uh, we can uh, build some kind of GitHub action that we mandate that every project uses and which reports whether or not the entire code is covered by uh, licensing declarations, then I think that would. This would allow for evaluation to be very easy. I don't know of one off the top of my head. We do have uh, either quarterly or twice a year. Uh, LF does do scanning, uh, but I will have to look into uh, to see if there are any actions to watch licenses. Um, one. Uh, Difficulty here would be the penalty for non-compliance uh, would either be relicensing, the, the mitigation would be relicense, uh, remove the code, or the it would have to be something more drastic than move the deprecated. And I don't know what that would be off the top of my head. Crazy. So, so Rai, I guess that means that what you're trying to say is that if people are non-compliant with the legal requirements that we have for Hyperledger and they're not doing anything to fix them, then the, the result in the action would potentially be even removing the code from uh, the Hyperledger repositories. Is, did I understand correctly when you said kind of drastic? Uh, yeah, I would have to consult with our lawyers. Um, I think the, the easiest mitigation would be to make the repo private um, in the interim, and then we would have to figure out uh, if that would be removing the code or some other, I don't know, Hart has his hand up, Hart. Yeah, I'm just going to agree with Rye. We can't mess around with this. Um, so uh, we would have to ask the lawyers about this. And they are, I, I mean, this this is like priority zero or priority 0 0.5 for why the Linux Foundation exists. Yeah. Is having a hand you know, having uh, a good handle on licensing. Uh, we haven't really had any projects where licensing was an issue, where when stuff was brought up, when Scott sent me an email saying, hey, by the way, we were able to get that uh, remediated fairly trivially, uh, but that might not always be the case. This is also something that legal will help us typically with on a very fast time scale. Uh, 
okay so uh, for the purpose of this task force then uh, we'll just have document that the uh, i guess yeah maybe uh, if we just can find out more in heart or uh, right uh, the penalty for non compliance will be basically just uh, uh, as you say move uh, not just to deprecate it but make it a private repo until can be rectified right I mean, Rama, I think you can put like determined by LF legal staff or something there. Um, because it would highly, I mean, there could be like very major things and there could be very minor things, right? Yeah. But yeah, I don't think deprecation solves anything. So I would, I would take that out. I guess I guess the question. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand, but I, anyway, um, I guess the question becomes right. If we have a project that is, let's using using our current terms, right, graduated, and they're not dealing with the the legal ramifications. Um, you know, maybe it's just one repo out of many. Right, like we can move that repo to private, but what should happen to the actual project itself at that point? Um, you know, if they're not following best practices, then, um, you know, and maybe maybe this becomes a non-question if for some reason we just start to capture the badges and not states. Um, but if we do continue to have a project lifecycle states, then, um, you know, I, I do think that something should be done to, to a project that says, hey, this is not really a graduated project because they're not acting under the best practices anymore. Uh, Tracy? I, yeah. oh, sorry to jump oh, in. Keep going on. No, go ahead. I thought I was the only one with my ra hand raised. Go ahead, Rama. No, no, I, uh, I thought Tracy was asking dry, but you can go ahead. Um, I think this this would be a, a big judgment call, I think, because there are so many different ways that a project could be in non-compliance. And some of them might be that like somebody just made a small mistake, right? Um, they might, someone might make a legal mistake despite following like best, uh, you know, best software practices, right? So I would think that the TSC would have to judge this on a case by case basis. Uh, yeah, I guess I agree with that. I think that, you know, I'm thinking about something, I guess, more critical, but yeah, you're right that we, we need to think about the minor to the critical and, and what actions would be taken based on the different, um, you know, different ways in which somebody is non-compliant. Right, like a, a third party dependency changing licensing or something could be an issue, right? We've we've seen this. Sure. Yep. And that's like, you know, as long as you respond quickly, right, you know, you probably shouldn't be punished at all for that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. And what what is what is quickly? Um if it's a major major dependency of your project, um, quickly may be longer than you would expect it to be or want it to be. Um, but yet, you know, you've at least recognized that and, um, maybe called it out as well. I don't know. Right. Like, I feel like there's some, some certain things that, you know, could potentially delay somebody from being able to respond in a quick manner. Peter? I agree, but I will also say that if you've been using a dependency that's a major part of your project and then they change the license, then you should be able to keep your version of dependency pinned to the last uh, version that has the license that you want. Uh, so I would, in that scenario, in that hypothetical, I would 
expect the project to pin it to the version with the license that's acceptable. And then if it takes a long time to migrate away, then they can do that while they have it pinned to the license that's correct. Okay. Uh, is there anything uh, I don't know hard try? Maybe you can find out and shed more light on this. Uh, uh, in the meantime, I guess we will. The decision we have to make is simply uh, like, uh, what is the penalty for non-compliance? And I, it looks like we can't have a one size fits all penalty, right? So we'll just have to uh, evaluate in case by case basis. Uh, Jim. Yeah, uh, this makes me wonder. Uh, the league, the, these badges are applying to the releases or applying to the current uh, latest code in Maine? Because there can be a huge difference in the case, in the hypothetical case that Peter just mentioned, which can, can be real, right? In some of the very popular um, open source projects like Mongo is moving to a more commercial um, uh, stance and moving back from open source. Something like this may actually happen in the future. Uh, are we applying these to, are, are we making a difference between, okay, so all the existing releases are still compliant and there's a status of the badge applied to those, but the latest in master is out of compliance and there is a different badge for that. That's something to consider. Good question. I think implicitly I thought it applied to the latest uh, for the main, but uh, maybe others can agree. Steven? Um, in the case that was just raised, um, the if they pin, if if a project were to pin on on an open source one, then they are in compliance with this. So really, that case is is kind of um, doesn't cause a problem. So we should assume the situation where they're out of compliance, they've stuck with the Mongo, you know, hypothetical Mongo moving to a private source. And are, and are still using it. And then that would be the case that goes to the LF legal staff. Um, if they come up with a mitigation, just like you talked about, um, where they remain legal then or remain open source, then it's not an issue. Yeah, so, and I, I think, you know, Jim, a little bit to, to your point, I think if we look at, how we're going to monitor this or, or the frequency of which we're going to monitor this, right? This one particularly says continuous. Um, you know, if it's continuous, then it should be what the badge is uh, currently, not what the badge was when release 1.0 was um, put out or something like that, right? Um, and, and so I think for each of these sorts of badges, we need to look at what is the frequency of which we're going to run these things. Um, you know, and if it's a quarterly badge, then, you know, maybe we mark these as Q1 2023 um, badge or something like that, right? But if it's a continuous badge, I think it's a, a yes, no sort of answer uh, for whenever the person who is interested in the badging of these looks at them. At least that's my take on this. Tracy, I think uh, in, in previous meeting, we tentatively agreed, or at least there were no objections to uh, evaluating badges on a quarterly basis. Um, but uh, in this particular case, do, do you think it would be useful to have a, a, a badge associated with the latest snapshot and badges tagged to particular releases? Uh, right. I think that that would just be adding noise. Um, mm -hmm. sure. But 
I, I think it's reasonable to have badges, you know, tied to a release as opposed to a snapshot. And I will point out, uh, I did have a conversation a little while ago with uh, one of our member companies where they were confused about um, just graduated status. Does that apply to uh, only one, uh, like Fabric entered inter graduation back at whatever, release 1.1. Is that the only release that Fabric did under that graduated status? Is that the only one that apply, it applies to? So there is some communication clarity that we need uh, to provide around this. And I don't think adding any more noise would be helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. Katie? Yeah, I, I agree, right? I mean, I think, you know, people want to know what the current status is more than anything, right? As as they are reviewing the different projects and deciding which one to use, what is it? What does it currently look like? Um, maybe there's some trends or, or historical data that they might be interested in, and I think we should decide what those things are. But you know, if you look at the graduated status, as you said, right, it's a it's a one and done. Um, you did it or you didn't do it. Uh, but the question I have more you know, yeah, okay, I got a degree, but am I continuously learning? Am I growing? Am I improving? Right, that's that's what really matters. Um, and I think that's what should matter for our projects as well, is whether or not there's continuous improvement, uh, that the health of the, the community is um, maintaining or improving, right? Um, you know, I think the the challenges that we have right now is we don't have a, a way to to see that on a regular basis. Um, you know, we get the quarterly reports, we're told what we're told, whether or not it's accurate or not, um, is a judgment call by us as to you know based on information that we've gleaned from conversations or work in the community or or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's really hard to know unless you're in there day to day or being able to track certain things day to day, whether or not a project really is doing well still, or did they graduate um, and and they're you know they're they've gone downhill since that graduation, right? Like that was the end of the glory days, and um, nothing else is is happening in, in there. Um, project at this point, right? So I think that's the that's the challenge of why this particular task force keeps coming up is because we haven't really solved the, the real problem, which is determining what the current and true status of the project is. Good point, thank you. Uh, Bobby? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, that like the the great point is the continually monitoring this stuff, um, and so when we were thinking of the tokens in the dashboard, if you think of all of the different uh, badge types, like a slice of a of a pizza pie, and that when you've completed it, like you've got the whole pie colored in, and then you get that badge, um, and or the tokens that require you to fill that in, you get the tokens to move on to that next phase. And as far as continually monitoring, it could be tied into that new thing that we're doing with the TOC where we uh, take that uh, a project for that one big report every year and run the, have the maintainers run the check through the dashboard that we're going to create in the next mentorship program, which shows you the status of all of those badge types. Makes sense. Again, I think this is uh, maybe necessarily, uh, I mean, this applies to the whole, this entire project, this entire uh, task force, not just to the legal criteria. I mean, we, we do want uh, uh, to know precisely how well the project is doing, and we need to have a good way to uh, uh, both to track it accurately and to visualize this in a way that is intuitive to, to people. So, yep, point taken.
Okay. Maybe we'll uh, again revisit this issue uh, tomorrow's and next uh, badging task force meeting. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next one, maybe we'll be able to cover one or two more in the time we have left. Um, this is the diversity badge, and uh, diversity means uh, uh, basically the amount of decentralization and uh, community involvement in a particular project. Let me go back to the criteria listed here. Uh, so, uh, project must have an active and diverse set of contributing members representing various constituency, and uh, uh, project is not highly dependent on a single contributor. And the number here is important, specifically, there are at least three legally independent committers. And there's no single company or entity that is vital to the success of the project. So, uh, I think both these things are important. Uh, and as uh, this came up, as Tracy mentioned in the, I think the last uh, task group meeting, uh, the incubation exit criteria also requires uh, three or more uh, legally independent uh, or three or more uh, organizations participating in the maintenance formally. So, they should be listed in the maintenance.md file. And uh, also, the loser criteria which we have to monitor is that uh, there's no single company or entity that is dominating the project. So, like if you have, uh, uh, you, you could have, uh, uh, say, it's, uh, eight uh, contributors, and uh, two of them uh, are in uh, two, uh, one in company one, another one in company two, and say six of them in company three. Uh, that might mean that uh, company C has uh, an overwhelming amount of power in deciding what's what's going on in the project. Uh, so that is also something to watch out for, and it, it should presumably not meet the decentralization criteria unless uh, the maintenance can show that uh, all uh, th there's not too much of a skew in the contributions made by any single organization. So I think that's kind of what we decided. Um, how we check this? Um, okay, this, this all written in the notes here as well. Um, the question is how to check this. Uh, not sure if there is really a programmatic way to find out uh, how diverse contributions are to a given project. Um, the one easy thing we can do is uh, we add an uh, organization field to the maintenance the MD file, and then we have a uh, we can have a GitHub action track this, but again. It's pretty easy thing to look at and evaluate. takes takes a few seconds. Uh, uh, other than that, uh, uh, again, if you're uh, if somebody is going to take the responsibility of uh, uh, evaluating this particular badge, then they can look at uh, uh, the commit activity and as well as the uh, help dashboard, uh, the links to which I think we uh, submit in every quarterly report. Those can be checked to see uh, how diverse the contribution has been. And uh, so, yeah, at this point, it looks like uh, this is going to be a manual check that uh, uh, reviewers, that is, uh, one or more of the POC will have to do. Does that make sense? Okay, I see no objection. Uh, what should the parent, okay, Trace. Sorry. Um... Right. Is is there anything that we can do with the the GAG um, potentially to to see this? I guess G, GAG though doesn't really have a org in it. Is that correct? That's correct. But we can uh, we can we can get that right. So if we went into GAG um, and updated the, there's nothing blocking us from adding uh, more data to the uh, maintainers.csv, right? We could add a company affiliation. By we, I mean me. Um, so uh, the answer is yes, sort of. We're not there yet, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think company affiliation is always the tough part to get uh, with this, right? Um, because company affiliation changes over time and uh you know being able to track the contributions to a particular time frame for a particular company um you know is is the the challenge i i guess if we're looking only at current then it is a matter of what is your current 
um, affiliation, right? Be it independent or with a company. Um, and, and then, you know, based on that, we could do some sort of percentage here, right? So uh, X percent comes from company X, Y percent comes from, I think you guys get it, right? Um, but the, the different sorts of uh, percentages based on the, the different companies that are maintainers or uh, individual affiliation. Yep, I think that's what we would like to figure out. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, sir. Uh, so we are, I think we are at the end of the hour. So then we'll take it, we'll continue this the next next time we have uh, this review. And uh, tomorrow uh, we have the next edition of the uh, task force meeting, same time as this meeting. So, yep, uh, please join the call to uh, contribute, give any feedback. All right, thanks, Roma. Sure. We will. I do want to point out that it <laughs> now, when you talk about percent contribution, we get we that that's a, a whole other can of uh, corn, right? Like, are we talking about PR comments? Are we talking about lines of code, right? So that's an even harder thing to measure. Yeah. No, I think what I was trying to say was not contribution, but percent. Uh, th this number of maintainers it come from company X versus this number of maintainers come from company Y. Um, not how how much of the contributions come from company X versus company Y. Um, because this one is particularly focused on maintainers um, that I, I, I was trying to communicate that poorly. Um, so hopefully that <laughs> maybe clarifies a bit. Okay. No, I was actually thinking about contributions and yeah, both what points that you and Ryan raised uh, uh, are uh, important. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to track the contribution. Yeah, you know, is it percentage of the commits over the uh, project's life cycle? Or, yeah, I, and that's the one thing I can think of, but I don't know if that's something we want to use to issue badges, issue this particular time. Okay, well, I guess with that, we will close out today's meeting. Thank you, Rama, for the updates and for the discussion, everyone. We will uh, obviously see everyone again next week um, with a couple of different topics that I've heard from today. One being an update on the security um, PR. The second being uh, the move to uh, graduate it from Cacti. And then I don't remember which thing is up next, but I feel like, Peter, it may be you uh, for the automated pipeline. So um, I did include that in the agenda. I just can't remember what it was. So uh, we will take a look at those things next week. So thanks, everybody, for participating and joining. Thank you.